bored. Welcome to the Friskies Express. Please keep all paws and tails inside the train. To the right, you'll see Crunch Canyon. To your left is Filet Falls. Now you're passing Party Mix Peak. Today's delicioso tour is almost over. But don't worry. With Friskies, there's always more to explore. Check out friskies.com to explore more. I'm Joseph. And I'm Nick. And this is Fish Jelly. It sure is. How are you? I am good. Uh, I'm uh, my energy's hitting a lull, uh, but good. Good. And you? I'm okay. <laughs> you just returned from Palm Springs. I did. What were you doing in Palm Springs? I was planning something terrible. No, uh, I was attending the Palm Springs Film Festival. Uh, there were a couple of selections you wanted to see that were only playing there? No, just stuff I'd missed and yeah. What are some highlights? The, the, one, the one I waited too long to get a ticket for starred Fanny Ardant, which would have been the highlight, but I'm not about, I can't stand waiting in those lines there because even with the press pass, I still have to wait in a line with those people that seemingly have nothing better to do than wait in line um, and talk loudly. Uh I'm not, I'm I'm not doing a standby line. It's not happening. You watched three films in particular. You yes, wanted to I talk just thought, about. I just had three. I got in Friday afternoon and left this morning. Um, two of them from directors. I'm like, why do I? I'm curious about. I'm trying to think back of when I thought these people were notable, but um, that, to, that I needed to see their films. But Michael Winterbottom has another new film who works quite a bit. Uh, it's called Shoshana, and I thought it was just okay. Uh, it's set in 1930s, 40s in Israel and Palestine, which is kind of uh, an interesting place to uh, watch something right now. But it's technically a political thriller based on a true story, uh, but it's about... Uh, and, and I think if you are completely ignorant about the history... <laughs> of this part of the world it you know it, it it has some illuminating things but uh i mean for my i forgot how palestine was under british rule uh so this is about these two british police officers who are looking for uh arab terrorists and uh eventually kill them and one of them gets killed in turn but it was just okay and then the title is for the young woman named shoshana uh the jewish woman that is loves one of the british police officers and then she kind of and she's narrating the film but she kind of just falls out of the picture i, I don't i think it's odd that she, it bears her name <laughs> okay what's the other one? Oh god i really didn't like the convert um lee tamahori who's whose best film is probably still his original or his uh, debut, which he's best known for, which I still haven't seen, but I own once were warriors, New Zealand filmmaker. We referenced him before because you and I uh, watched along came a spider because <laughs> he did a series with, remember that with Morgan Freeman? And oh not, yes. Not very good. Yeah. Uh, most of his Hollywood films, I, d I think are trash. Um, I, to be fair, I haven't seen die another day. He also did that movie next with, Nick Cage and Julianne Moore. Uh, but this is set in the 1830s. And I feel like if I had made you watch this, you probably would have a greater appreciation for something like The Mission, which, oh. which I loved. And I know you were so, so on. But uh, this is about, uh, again, a uh, British ex-soldier turned priest who shows up uh, in this British settlement colony to you know tend to the spiritual needs of the people and ends up being drawn into the Ma maori tribes and, and the conflicts between these two tribes it it has some a couple of decent action scenes but i thought it was stupid i, I didn't like it i didn't like it oh. and um, what else and it's just interesting too like the perspective of the white savior from this filmmaker i thought was curious uh, anyway uh the last film thankfully i did like uh filmmakers check to second film i haven't seen his first one uh mate triple check triple check this competed in 
the Karlavi Very Film Festival last year. It's called We Have Never Been Modern. Again, a period piece set in 1937 uh, with this, uh, again, it's a, it's told through the eyes of the woman, Helena, who his husband has developed this factory that's becoming this new economic center. That's what it's gearing up to be. Uh, and they're, they purchase land all around them to create this, you know, new city when, uh, sorry, the cat's screaming and interrupting my thoughts, but when all of a sudden on the building site, they find someone has abandoned a fetus, a baby that was born. That's also in the term of this time, uh, a a hermaphrodite, which wouldn't, we would now call intersex. And the husband thinks that it's somebody trying to sabotage his glory, but the wife uh, who also works in the infirmary that's on site realizes that the person that had this baby had to have had it there because there's security. There's, there's nobody that would have con- planted a hermaphroditic fetus on the premises. And so then she starts to uh, read about this condition and learning that it's hereditary and locates based on timekeeping records, the man that gave birth to this baby that's also intersex and left it on site. Oh. Uh, but there's just a lot of really fascinating things. And I think a really great central uh, uh, lead performance that I quite liked. Well, moving on, there were several many messages to talk about Dave Chappelle's Netflix special, The Dreamer, uh-huh. which I already feel like I'm tired of talking about. <laughs> but... Well, we didn't really talk about it yet. No, but so why are you tired of talking about it? Because I talked about it with other people, but um, so of course the big thing was that he talks about trans people again and gay people and uh trace lissette an actress who has received critical acclaim for the movie monica made a couple of i believe TikTok Mm -hmm. uh, or instagram stories i'm not sure sort of you know dragging him a bit but what did we think about the special? I thought it was okay. I thought it was just okay, yeah. Um, it's not his best work by far. No, and then when we finally get around to why it's titled the way it is, I think, well, this is like a really nice, hopeful message. So, <laughs> But it feels really lopsided from where it begins. This felt like, uh, I, I didn't bother to look if we even know what his Netflix deal is, but if it's like, if he had to do three comedy specials and this is the final one, it felt like he took, what was on the cutting room floor of the first two and made a third one out of it. It doesn't feel that inspired. No. And I understand why he's still insistently uh, making jokes about trans people because he's, he's the type of comedian that's not going to be told what he can and can't talk about. Uh, So I, and it's like, he has to respond. So I get that, but I, you know, because at the last special where he talks about the trans person he befriended who died, yeah that 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 had some meaning that like that there was some poignancy to that where it's like i you know i don't believe and i've said this before i don't believe he's transphobic but i just think that this time around it's doing extra in a way because the opening joke is about meeting jim carrey on the set of man on the moon when jim carrey was a you know there's a documentary about that too infamously uh going all method playing andy kaufman so uh, Chappelle's Carey was one of his heroes and he had the opportunity to meet him. And that was probably the worst time to meet him because Jim Carrey was on one. And he said, having to uh, address Jim Carrey by calling him Andy as if he's Andy Kaufman, he said that's, he equates to how he feels talking to trans people. And it's like, well, that's the problem there with that is this is Jim Carrey putting on an ax and trans people aren't acting like this is their, this is their identity. <laughs> I thought that the story, the, the the way he crafted the story and not knowing where it was going is clever because he is a very talented storyteller and he is obviously a fantastic stand-up comedian. Yes. And when he made that statement, I was like, oh, okay, so we're going to follow this up with something to kind of give it some meaning. And then he doesn't. He just says that and moves on. Yes. And I felt like that just felt unnecessarily petty in a way that I think he is better than. Yeah. Um. But overall, I just thought that with everything going on in the world, and as someone who's considered like one of the greatest stand-up comedians of all time, mm-hmm. it just felt like 
this didn't feel that inspired. It felt just kind of like, oh, I came out here to tell some jokes. At a point, he says he's going to walk off stage to smoke a cigarette and that he, uh, this would be the moment where people would give him their standing ovation. And so he walks off to get a cigarette and people don't even stand up. <laughs> and they know and, they're being filmed. And they know. So I wonder if he kept that in to show that his audience also won't be told what to do. But I I think the the feeling I got watching it was this hasn't been that funny. And, you know, I have opinions about the things he has said about trans and people and gay people. But that aside, I, I, I mean, I just didn't think that this was his best work. And... He was recording this in D.C. at the same theater where he recorded Killing Them Softly, which is his 2000 special that I um, had on uh, on my very first iPad or iPad, iPod, which was the first iPod. I remember putting that comedy special on there and listening to it on a repeat mm -hmm. for years. I think it's brilliant. It's so funny. I could put it on any time. And for him to make reference to that special more than once in this special felt so like, I mean, this doesn't even compare to the level of storytelling, the humor, the range of topics. It's like with everything going on in the world right now, the, like you, you spend a lot of time talking about not, you know, few topics and also repeat, like repeat topics. Mm -hmm. So I, I just don't. I don't know if I were a Netflix executive and I'm like, we paid 60 million for these three. And the third one, I mean, it's just kind of like, I, I, I would have expected more range. That being said, I did enjoy the first two. He tells a story. He, he Well, he had the first two and then the one during COVID. So there are four now, right? Remember the one that he filmed outdoors? Oh in Ohio? yeah. Yeah. That's right. So then he talks about Will Smith and Chris rock. And I, I didn't love his, I don't have a problem with what he said about it. I just didn't think it was that entertaining. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. he, he, he basically said that he understood Will's position, that he was frustrated and that sometimes you just got to let it out. And that he also understands Chris's position that he needed to just move on. Like he couldn't react in that moment. Yeah. But then in the end, he says the difference is Will, if that were me, Will Smith wouldn't have been able to sit for the rest of the show and enjoy right the show implying that he would have done something so then it's like well i, I like i don't really <laughs> he tells a story about how he facetimed chris rock and chris actually picked up and then he makes a joke about asking him if it hurt and uh, uh, like again it wasn't that funny then the other thing that he's getting heat for is he basically calls little nas x um the gayest N word ever. And that's in relation to the title of the special, the dreamer basically saying that sometimes we're in other people's dreams. Mm -hmm. And you said that you enjoyed that section. I actually don't know what I think he was trying to say. Oh no. I mean like the, I think the message of overall humility, you have to know when sure this isn't, you're not the center of the attention right now. Again, I just don't think this was his finest work. I don't think this was Dave Chappelle level storytelling. Well, I don't it, think these jokes were hitting. Like he's good friends with Seinfeld, isn't he? Oh, is he? Isn't he? I think that's Chris is Rock. Is that Chris Rock? Yeah. I thought Seinfeld was friends with all. Like, uh, I mean, I'm sure everyone at the same but, but level. I, I thought they're all friends with him. Um, but it kind of reminded because the way he was talking about Little Nas X is like when he showed up at this party, he didn't know who he was. It's like, well, you're you're really in a bubble, then, sir. Like, <laughs> yeah like even the way Seinfeld he starts that story is like you're not well he, it was also like i think his third yeah the, the way he started that section it was like you don't know who little Nas x is because he references the the video where he's lap dancing with the devil so, yeah so little Nas x had already had like some really big songs so that seemed weird and then yes he does call him that but then he's basically saying like you know this guy dreamed that he would be this and he made it mm -hmm. so it, it oh you had said that it felt inspirational sure i, I mean I, I think also i feel tired of talking about it because i don't think that there's anything egregious or that interesting about the special nothing really stood out to me except that it was just kind of not at the level i expect from him mm -hmm. um and that i do think it's kind of weird that 
you continue to like it just at minimum it's petty yes. in worst case scenario he really is transphobic and which i don't want to think he is but you know and and, and i don't know that i do it just seems i don't like think he's I, like he's above that i don't me. think he is because he's a titan in this arena and comedy you know as we've been told forever is like the last place where people can say things that they're not supposed to be able to say right. so and, and i think that anybody that is watching any kind of comedy and they want to be offended it's like well that's that's the nat that's the rules of this game like there nobody is uh doing comedy to make you comfortable sure i agree i agree but he also makes fun of like punching down and then he talks about how he's only going to talk about disabled people now and and then i like like i thought that was funny because it had a purpose like, yes like he's making a point i just don't know that in this special i felt like he was making good points it just felt more like you're being petty i do agree with you that it is a comedian's job to you know you're not going to call out a comedian and think that they're not going to comment on it mm -hmm. so he's doing his job if, and so for that, I don't fault him. But. I think I just wish people would realize if something offends you, don't get out there and talk about them and put them on blast. Just ignore it. If everybody ignored things they didn't like he said about the trans community, he would stop saying shit. He's only doing that because he keeps getting shit for it. You know who I'd rather talk about? A, co a comedian doing crazy, saying crazy things? Cat Williams. <laughs> oh my god cat williams he was on club shay shay which is shannon sharp's like youtube like talk show and cat williams episode went viral i mean it has tens of millions of views like, like in the first three days that it's been out and he has said so he said so many outrageous things mm -hmm. that the the interview is long it's two and a half hours it's i've watched long. it twice <laughs> like in the background but um he makes a lot of uh you watched a little bit of it yeah what was your um, impression my it's the same impression i've always had of cat williams is he doesn't give a fuck uh no <laughs> and uh the, you know this is the first time i've seen him <laughs> wearing a hat like the whole time and i did think he he kind of looks like ludicrous but well let's start there he so some of the crazy things he says is that he basically implies that he and Ludacris were invited to join the Illuminati mm -hmm. and that they chose Ludacris over him, but that they had offered him $200 million um, to, to do a franchise. And of course he'd be referring to fast and furious. Uh -huh. He also alleges that Steve Harvey started, stopped doing stand up comedy because 15 years ago they were at a, like a comedy festival in Chicago and, Cat Williams embarrassed Steve Harvey in front of everyone by calling him out for wearing a wig. So that was interesting. I mean, he, I mean, what about the teeth? He doesn't mention the teeth. <laughs> um, he, well, except his own, and he calls out Shannon Sharp's teeth, which, you know, he has beautiful teeth. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about Steve Harvey's teeth. But <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> There's more than one thing I'm to be embarrassed about. I'm surprised Cat didn't mention the teeth. Uh, he talks about, uh, Kevin Hart just basically saying that he's he lies yeah he's not genuine <laughs> he talks oh, a lot on. about Ricky Smiley just being like he he comments about Ricky Smiley and Tyler Perry about saying that they're only they can only act when they're in a dress <sighs> Tyler's done movies not in a dress he said that Martin Lawrence uh wanted Cat Williams to be in Big Mama's house too but wanted him to wear a dress and he refused to do so. So that's why he's not in it. He makes fun of Michael Blackson, the African comedian, basically saying like, he's a real African doing a fake African accent and cr criticizing him. What about Kim? Oh God. Kim K. I think to me, that was the most, the most I, shocking. The only thing that I kind of had a sharp intake of breath about was like, Oh, you're, and then, uh, his question about it and doubles down. <laughs> yeah he basically Sh shannon asks cat about kanye west and cat is giving his opinions and at one point says he married a whore talking about kim kardashian <laughs> and then he kind of says well wait wait but then like essentially doubles down <laughs> by saying well he knew she was a whore like that's what he wanted i mean i'm not a fan of any kardashian but it's like then i don't know like <laughs> I, that's not how i 
casually refer to them. <laughs> oh my God. He says that P. Diddy propositioned him for sex and that he had to turn him down and that he has receipts. He also says that Weinstein um, asked to suck his penis and he had to say no. I had to. He says that he's never done drugs except marijuana, even though everyone always says that he's like on drugs. He does admit that he's been arrested many, many times, but it's basically for being reckless. He talks about a lot of black men in Hollywood who drink the Kool-Aid end up getting these ugly light-skinned wives. <laughs> God. I thought that was shocking. I think he's just rude and he seems really petty and he has very specific gripes about the profession that he's in he does talk about you know melma melba moore uh got a star on the hollywood walk of fame and cat williams paid for it and i thought him oh, talking I, I thought him talking about that was really um powerful because he basically said that because he shannon asked him like do you have a personal relationship with her and he said no he doesn't know her but the truth is he was supposed to get the star mm -hmm. and that he said that before you offer me the star, what about this person who's been sitting on the list? And just because she doesn't have 75,000 to pay for it, because you have to pay you for your pay star. For your own, yeah. And I, most, well, because the Kardashians wanted one. Right. And they were told no, right? So he said, before you give me one, give this lady one. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I thought the way he described why he did it um, was really sweet. And so then he said that he, he said God won't allow that, and so he'll send a fool like me to take care of it, and so that's why he paid for it. Um, he's he has some profound things to say, but I, I he's a frustrating interview subject because Shannon's asking him things, and he just goes off on these tangents that are barely related to what the question was. He seems like a boiling pot that just is going to explode. Like he makes moment. me nervous. He, there's a comedian named Earthquake who we know. I mm -hmm. think he's very funny, but he says Earthquake can't be a famous movie star because he's illiterate. <laughs> Call that man out on this platform. <laughs> um, I mean, he could still learn to read if he can. But there, there's so much uh, in this two and a half hour interview that, uh, you know, if you know who Steve Harvey, Cedric the Entertainer, Ricky Smiley, if you know these people, if you know Cat Williams, I think you would find it alarming amusing disrespectful <laughs> but i think it's worth the watch i don't he's always seemed that way though i don't know I, I don't know if people are i think he's doing his job i think people forget i mean this is yeah he's getting more attention than other people that were in the same seat on that show moving on to the restaurant section i want to talk about mcdonald's for a second because you know i like to go to mcdonald's to get coffee whenever there's a coupon on the app so i don't i will only drink mcdonald's coffee if there's a coupon because it's 99 cents. Mm -hmm. If I have to pay full price for McDonald's coffee, I'll just go to Starbucks. But anyway, I had two things I wanted to say. Whenever I go in the drive-thru, they always ask, are you going to use your mobile app? And mm -hmm. I always say yes. And one out of 20 times, like 5% of the time, they'll say, okay, give me your code. You give them the code and then they go, okay, well, they, they can see what the coupon's for. So they'll ask you like what size or whatever. But more often than not, the majority of the time, they don't even ask for the code. They ask if you're going to use the mobile app. You say yes. And they go, okay, well, what do you want? <laughs> like, okay, well, I don't know why you asked me. So this morning, I went to get coffee. And are you going to use your mobile app today? Yes. What would you like? Give my order. Pull to the second window. Go to the second window. Give my code. And the guy is like, oh, you have to give me that code before you order. And I'm like, well, I told you I was going to use it. <laughs> But here's the gag. He was visibly and audibly sick. Oh. He <coughs> sounded like, <coughs> like that, Ooh. wearing a K95 mask, and he was making my coffee. Oh. And then his hands looked gross. That He had long fingernails. They were dirty. And one of his fingers had a Band-Aid on it. And that Band-Aid looked like he hadn't changed it in like two days. And I see him as the one making my coffee. And, you know, they have to put that lid on your coffee yeah so i'm already annoyed because he's like well you have to like if i take your code now it's going to shut down the computer or something and i'm like i i didn't say this but in my mind i'm like i've been in the drive through a hundred times in the past year and they've always taken my code after i order so i don't know why this is different but i just sat there and looked at him like he was crazy and then he's like well let me try <laughs> and then he took it 
and then I see him making my coffee. So then when he brings it back, he goes, okay, well, that'll be a dollar seven or whatever. And then I had to stand up for myself and I said, I'm sorry, you are obviously sick. You have a dirty bandaid on and you just like handled my coffee in the top. Like, I can't take that. Mm -hmm. So I just rolled off. Oh, what well, was this a dollar seven? So, so um, that's all I wanted to say. But you Did know what? You I was... get a coffee somewhere else? Or... No. Oh, see, so I would have gone somewhere else. Well, because then I started thinking, and I've always thought this, but today it really got to me is like, you know, they handle the top of your coffee, whether you go to Starbucks or Coffee Bean or McDonald's, you know, the person's handling that top and they're, you know, their nasty palm is touching the part where you put your mouth and they're taking other people's money. They all are playing with their nasty ass phones. This motherfucker was like, probably had COVID. Oh, so you just, you'd spiraled. I spiraled. Okay. Yeah. All right. So then I was thinking what? Like someone needs to come up with a way to make this more sanitary. When you go, when, when we go to a restaurant and order wine, if the server brought your wine and palmed the top of your wine glass, wouldn't you be like, what yes. the fuck? Mm -hmm. But with our coffee, they do that all the time. Mm -hmm. They put their little Petri dish palm all over the top of your coffee. Well, I know that they're supposed to be washing their hands regularly. On Chill. You, you don't, you don't have to know that you can see that they don't like they're taking people's money. They're touching the fucking mop. At the they're... same time, you know, it's good to be exposed to some germs for your own immunity. Like, so <laughs> You can make excuses to feel better about it. And I'm sure I would too, because I'm going to continue to drink the coffee. Well, I rarely buy coffee. I mean, I make so much coffee at home. All I'm know. saying is I'm surprised someone hasn't come up with a way to uh, reassure customers that their coffee is handled in a hygienic, sanitary way. Even Starbucks. I mean, you see those people making stuff and they're touching boxes and opening cabinets. Like, no, you've never seen anyone sanitize any of those surfaces during the work day, but they're touching everything. The cash register. I don't know. It's too much for me. Sure. We had a couple of questions. Oh, you, you don't want to talk about the bagels I brought you from Palm Springs? Oh, yeah. You waited in line. In your restaurant set? I waited in a line. Because you I heard everyone them. talking. All these loud ass people talking around me. The, 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 oh, these old people, these old dumb people. One lady who was obsessed with CW shows. It's like, bitch, you are too old for that. Uh, <laughs> going on and on about friends. Girl, lady, and saying May, December, I couldn't understand. I really didn't like it. But Elvis, Boz Lerman's Elvis was great. Bagels. The, towny bagels in Palm Springs is a, the hot new thing, I guess, but because uh, they're New York style bagels where you know they boil before they bake um so i i brought you some bagels and there was a line uh this early sunday morning and that annoyed me they were good they were good i mean they're better than the bagels you'd buy at like pavilions or ralph's yeah for but sure. at the same time it's like I, I mean i wouldn't wait in line for bagels like that again I, I i'm not above waiting in a line i think it's just i have an automatic attitude at the type of people waiting in the line with me uh <laughs> You should end up like Howard Hughes and just live by yourself somewhere in a <laughs> We need to take a break. Hold on. All aboard! Welcome to the Friskies Express. Please keep all paws and tails inside the train. To the right, you'll see Crunch Canyon. To your left is Filet Falls. Now you're passing Party Mix Peak. Today's Delicioso tour is almost over. But don't worry. With Friskies, there's always more to explore. Check out friskies.com to explore more. Okay, there were a couple of questions. Someone wanted to know, do you prefer Andy Warhol or Keith Haring? Well, I think Andy Warhol was a dick. <laughs> well. You think so, too. Uh... <laughs> Well, I don't, I'm not familiar with Keith. I mean, I can picture what a Keith Haring print he, looks like, yeah. but I don't know. Like he's not as popular, I guess, as Andy Warhol to me. So I, I, well, the cultural contributions of Warhol, I suppose were greater, but, uh, Haring's yes. I'm, I'm very familiar with what his art looks like. Also, um, I read recently cause he had a, you know, he died of AIDS and he had a, I think it, I forget the title of his photograph. It's the unfinished one where it's just like the beginning of kind of his patterns and it's unfinished and some dum dumb uh, used AI to complete what the, the photograph would have been. Mm. <laughs> People were mad. 
<laughs> if I could afford originals from either, I would probably choose Warhol. Sure. I I I th- I don't know. I think oh, I think Warhol's kind of overrated and pretentious though too. Another question was now that we have Patreon, which for those who don't know, uh, we do, and a link will be in the details of this episode. Uh, will the episodes be shorter? The last two have been because the movies for fun section has been removed. Where I prattle on forever. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but you know, like this episode today will probably be a little longer than usual. Uh, but that's it. You did something in you did have something in the sorry to this man section regarding the rose. Yeah, we we recorded a review of the rose uh, for Patreon per a, a fan's paid request, uh, and I was bitching about Faith Hill. And I think I I think nobody had pointed this out to me yet, but I think I said better roses, and I meant to reference uh, "Peace in My Heart," the Joplin song she covered. Hmm. Moving on to films released, we didn't cover the Bricklayer. Uh, yes. Starring Aaron Eckert and Nina Dobrev directed by Rennie Harlan. Uh, I haven't seen a good Rennie Harlan. I don't know. I don't really like Rennie Harlan, but you know him because he used to be married to Gina Davis and directed Long Kiss Goodnight and Cutthroat Island and Showgirls. That's Paul Verhoeven. Oh, not Showgirls. Uh, Rennie Harlan. He also did, I think he did Die Hard 2. Uh, yeah, he just hasn't done anything good in a while. But this this came out. We do, we just watched Aaron Eckhart and something. I don't remember. Next, because you were confusing him with Thomas Jane. Okay. Uh, next is he went that way. Uh, Jeffrey Darling directed this film, starring the uh, the hot new Jacob Elordi from Saltburn and Priscilla, and Zachary Quint- Quinto. Oh, I was kind of interested. I in was that. too. We just didn't have time. Yeah. Next, Mayhem. Uh, I was also interested in this, and I had requested a screener. I don't know if that ever came. Uh, Xavier Jens, who is from the the Splat Pack of the mid two thousands, uh, fame for Frontiers, which I liked well enough. He has a new film called Mayhem. Lastly, Race for Glory. This is inspired by true events that occurred during the fierce rivalry between Germany, Audi, and Italy. Uh, I'm, Lancia at the 1983 Rally <laughs> World Championships, directed by Stefano Mordini. Yeah, I'm not interested. Projects of interest: Clara and the Sun. Uh, yes, Taika Waititi, who's not a filmmaker I love per se. His Thor Ragnarok is the best, m- one of the best Marvel films. But again, that's like I don't know how good that what what that really means for anything anyway but uh he and i can't i didn't like jojo rabbit and i really didn't like uh next goal wins but his new one sounds exciting because it's an adaptation of a kazuo ishiguro film a a novel who wrote never let me go among many other things and apparently jenny ortega is being considered and i think it's about uh she plays an artificial an artificial friend or something some kind of like megan oh uh projects oh no wait we forgot parker posey parker being white posey, lotus white lotus season three apparently it is going to be park posey oh that's I, I'm, it <laughs> and, uh no they announced a, a bunch of casts i think carrie coon was a name i remember from the list but i mean parker i'm there i i am there unfortunately there are several entries in the obituary section glennis johns yeah uh i referenced her recently because I watched, I'd watch something I'm like, oh, she's still alive, and uh, I'm like, didn't she just turn a hundred? Uh, <laughs> poor thing. Yeah, she's dead. Uh, she's probably still best known for Mary Poppins, uh, or as the grandma in Superstar. I think with as Molly Shannon's grandma, which I think was her last movie, or as the grandma in While You Were Sleeping. She was nominated for one Oscar in The Sundowners, and I actually watched half of that uh, last night. Uh, so I'll probably talk about that on some other podcasts cindy morgan from of tron fame uh i'm not a big fan of tron or tron legacy but yeah she died christian oliver who's an actor yes who i'm not familiar with but apparently he's known for a show called cobra 11 he died in a helicopter crash or no a plane crash oh yes that one Mm -hmm. yes Mm -hmm. yes he was on a private 
It's a very tiny plane. And his two daughters, right? And his two daughters are with him, and they were also killed. Mm. So that's crazy. Mm. And he was also quite young. He was only 51. Yeah. David Soul. Uh, of Starsky and Hutch fame. Yeah. He died as well. That's that. Okay. Today's secret film was my selection? Yours. Oh, it was. Uh, but I let you choose it. <laughs> and why is that well there's just a lot going on i couldn't think of anything okay so i suggested something gay that we haven't seen yeah but you selected the 1991 british coming of age thriller young soul rebels directed by isaac julian who i think is best known for a mid-length film called my langston hughes you had been sent this disc from strand no, not a disc. Uh, Strand re-released it last year, and oh. I had an award screener. Oh, for I see. It. Oh, Looking for Langston, sorry, is his previous film. Young Soul Rebels, the premise, two disc jockeys have a friend's murder to solve in the fringe group melting pot of 1977 London. I don't know if that premise makes sense to me. I don't. I didn't get the sense they were trying to solve the murder, but... <laughs> no, and that... that... As you're if going, anything, they're being accused of it, or one of them is right. Uh, it felt as you're probably about to go into it, felt like several different kinds of movies, uh, all uh, sandwiched into one. But the, well, di the disc jockey segment's very house party to me. Let's start there. So, what is this movie about? So, there are two best friends, Chris and Kaz. One is gay, one is not. The one who you would think is gay is the straight one. <laughs> yes, based on his dress. And based on the way he looks. He's, and he's kind of uh, vibrant. He's very, especially compared to the other one. But their names are Chris and Kaz. So Chris is the straight one. Kaz is the gay one. Okay, so it's it's meant to be uh, 1970s London, although it feels and looks like 1990s to me. But It does. With the Queen Silver Jubilee as the backdrop. Yeah. So there are three stories, basically. One is that a gay black man, a gay black man has been murdered by a white man in like a park, mm -hmm. like a, a cruising area. So, so that has happened. Then Chris and Kaz, they are DJs and they have a little underground thing going. They're really into P funk and soul music, mm -hmm. but 1970s London, no one's checking for that. So they're having a hard time breaking into like radio. So we see them trying to do that. Then each one of them, Chris and Kaz, uh, finds love. So Chris meets a woman na uh, named Tracy, played by Sophie Okanito. In her debut, yeah. She works in a radio station. And Kaz meets this young gay white man. I, did, I don't know if I mentioned, but Chris and Kaz are both black. Mm -hmm. Kaz meets a young gay white man named Billabud which is the reference to Melville. Uh, and they form a romance. So love is found for both. Their careers don't really take off, but I think the message of the story is that they realize that it's going to be an uphill battle for them. And as far as the murder goes, we find out that one of Kaz's coworkers, this white guy named Ken, mm -hmm. appears to be like a total closet case who seems to be like... in infatuated or curious about black men uh and so we find out that he's the one who killed mm -hmm. the black guy in the beginning of the movie the we should probably talk about that first scene um because we we're the, the film is not allowing us to see the white killer we just know that he's white but if you do you remember their passage of dialogue because it's recorded on the dead boy, the dead young man's name is TJ, and it's recorded on TJ's boombox. Well, I remember uh, the dead man saying, "Don't mess with the sounds, man." Mm -hmm. And then the you you see the white you only see their bodies, not their faces, but you see the white guy stop the music and then press record. Mm -hmm. It's very radio. Raheem. So the <laughs> recording is um, the the murders recorded, but you know, I think, but I think this movie overall is a gem. But he asks him his name, remember? he? Yeah, because he wants to get, like, he feels like they should get to know each other at least the slightest bit. Before he kills him. <laughs> but what I was going to say is I think this movie is a gem. I like the way it's shot. I think the actors um, 
have a lot of personality. It's kind of an uncut job. But the story is very busy. And it, yes, like, because <laughs> it really is three different stories and none of them are well developed. Mm -hmm. So, and in the end, I felt pretty unsatisfied. The setup's pretty, the, the first half hour I think is pretty good until we realize that it's not kind of uh, administering what it needs to for each of the separate things going on. Well, I think what works the best is the murder mystery component because we know that the killer is white. Mm -hmm. So then we meet a few white people and I, and I thought it was really interesting to sort of try to think like, is, is he is the one? Him? Is yeah. he the one? So I thought that worked really well. I think Sophie Okanito is like captivating on screen. Mm -hmm. And she cued that little dimple. <laughs> so I think that secondary to the murder mystery would have been a romance between she and I actually think a good movie would have been because she ends up going to queer spaces and she seems to be a lot more accepting than her little co-worker this white girl jill this dowdy looking girl mm -hmm. so i thought it, this this could have been a really progressive story about this young lady who meets a guy who's maybe like bisexual and she learns how to you know it, like that could have been fun well, the, the club that chris invites her to is i don't think it's really intended as a queer space but queer things are happening there. right it's a it's for black people that like it's like and they just happen to see two guys that are making out there and jill is weird about it but i i don't think that was really a it, it's just kind of a safe space for everybody so we've touched on the murder mystery the romance so as far as them becoming disc jockeys chris the straight one played by valentine naniella he goes to a radio station to try to meet with like their like like the, like the one black person who works there, who's like in a position of power. And that guy basically tells him like an hour of soul a week is an hour too much for some people. Oh so like, you know, you're going to have a hard time trying to break into radio in London at this time, but it's there that he not only meets Sophie Okanito, but we also get several scenes where we see a, how would you call it? It's not a statue, but it's a, like a cutout, a cutout of the queen, a figurine of Queen Elizabeth, yeah, waving like it's this mechanized uh, arm, yeah. And I thought that was really funny because we see it like five times. Yes, and he breaks it at one point. So at a point, we see Chris like going back to his neighborhood. He lives in. There's a name for that kind of housing in the UK. It's not tenement. tenement. Yeah, tenement. Uh, in at particular, I think uh, the neighborhood is called Dalston which is can which was considered uh like like it was where everybody that wasn't white had to live seemingly but it's interesting because i think the movie there the the cinematography is really nice it's quite vibrant there's a lot of texture to it mm -hmm. i think there are a lot of interesting shots and edits but uh well the, the way his neighborhood is depicted it doesn't feel undesirable no, but there are undesirable people there. There it's are the skinheads that there yeah. are a lot of shots of footwear. And there's one, there's one scene that is, I thought really eerie where it's men sitting on a wall and all we see are their military style boots. Yeah. And that those happen to be like three of the assholes that are kind of ganging up on people. But when we first see him headed home, we see three younger girls and he starts dancing with them and they start singing a little song like, let's get it together. Mm -hmm. Let's get I thought that was really cute. It's cute, yeah. Then, so an important uh, character uh, element to Chris is that he's biracial. Yeah, his mom. I liked his mom. His mom's the white one, and she comes in asking him for funny cigarettes. Yeah, she <laughs> likes to smoke weed, and she has hot draws. She is something else, and I thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. I thought a really cool scene is Chris uh, is in his room getting ready to go out one night. And the way it's shot is like we're looking at him laying on the bed while he's trying on pants. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a really, really interesting mm -hmm. shot. Also, these two, because Kaz, the gay one, works for a body shop, which is where the killer, his co-worker, Kevin, or is it Ken? Ken. Ken <laughs> works. But anyway, Kaz drives this beautiful cherry red car. Mm -hmm. And I just thought they are really bold because you have these skinheads basically like bullying them all the time. And then they drive this beautiful car and just park it out there and mm -hmm. no one seems to bother it. That seemed a little unbelievable to me. 
Sophie Okanito is so cute. Mm-hmm. She giggles a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, we have and to, she's t- you know, she's tall. She's very tall. I didn't realize she was. She, well, or Chris is. Um, well, at that club, Kevin scene, Hart status. Though. When she's dancing in the club scene, she's still taller than everybody. Mm-hmm. The subtitles in this movie. There were closed captions. Or, I'm sorry, closed captioning was a little crunchy. Yeah, because the acts, the cas, they kept saying cats, and he's played by Mo Sesse, by the way. And every time they talk about P funk, mm-hmm. like Parliament Funkadelic, mm-hmm. the closed captioning is PFA, like PFA. <laughs> I like the friendship between the two. There, there's some intimacy shared. Like at one point when Chris is changing and his shirt's off, Kaz like, "Oh, you've lost weight." And then they have this moment where there's like this kind of intimate hug. It's not sexual. Like, it's just like, oh, they're, they're buddies. Yeah. I thought their friendship seemed really sweet. So Chris finally gets an interview with like the head of the radio station, this white guy. And it goes south real quick because the white guy is telling Chris like, well, you know, we might give you a shot because, you know, people might find it a novelty to have like a black DJ, Mm -hmm. but then he's telling Chris, like, you need to basically sound more black. And and then this lingo sound like in, like have this African accent. Yeah. And in London, they mean more like, yeah, like, like African. So then of course, Chris mocks that the program director, whomever gets upset and then he, you know, loses his shot. So then all, like, you know, half an hour goes by and it's like someone, the person who was murdered, we're really not focusing on them. And then all of a sudden, Chris gets picked up by the police because the boom box of the victim is found and they believe that it's Chris who tried to destroy it mm-hmm. because a little girl says that he did. So then we get an interrogation. I felt like that was not very well written. No, and that's kind of where it starts to lose a lot of steam. Yeah. And, and and Chris starts to kind of go off the, the deep end a little bit. He does. <laughs> and then the, the like the investigator is being like quite racist, which is not not believable. Like he's saying things like, you know, you've been going to that Jungle Bunny club. Yeah, and... they start to get pretty <laughs> salty like, with their dialogue, which like, is oh. believable. But at the same time, it's like, okay. Um, and then, you know, this Billy Bud character played by Jason Durr is, inter- is interesting because we see when he meets Kaz, he catches his eye at this, the same club where Okanito goes to. And then he tries to take him to the cruising park where his friend was just murdered. And I think Billy Bud is a very interesting character because his white liberalism, I think, is constantly, I, I think, openly being mocked because it's like Kaz says, I'm really uncomfortable doing this here. And he's like, Oh yeah, but I want, I want to, I want to do this because I want to prove that th- it's not going to stop us from doing what we need to do. And it's like, yeah, but th- okay. I get that sentiment, but this is this guy's friend. You know, I also, I also thought that would make for a good movie is like this, like you described him like this overly liberal like activist gay white dude who's like in this relation this budding relationship with this black man and the white guy's a a little more active and how that plays out i thought that was interesting of course in this movie it's you know we only get a couple of scenes with them well billy bud keep billy keeps uh kind of doing that there that's some at the farmer's market farmer's or market yeah yeah it's, he's trying to hand out these pamphlets and he's openly antagonizing all of these people these white british people and it's like you know if you were black you couldn't do this uh just, yeah. and it just seems like well is this a, is this being effective is this an effective use of your time something else that didn't work for me is the timeline because at one point it seems like only like a couple of days have passed mm-hmm. and sophie okonito's character seems extremely invested in Chris after only knowing him for what would be like two or three days to the point where she gets him out of jail. <laughs> she, yeah, she, that's more than I would have done. She also has sure. sex with him a couple times in public. That's right. I kept, I said, well, she really doesn't want to bring him home. He lives with his mamas, but I get that. But I'm like, she, she doesn't want him at her house. I don't know. <laughs> Again, getting back to how scattered this movie is after, Chris gets out of jail. Then we see Chris and Kaz go and connect like their radio antenna illegally to some bigger antenna so they can do like an illegal broadcast. Mm -hmm. And Chris almost falls off this like, you know, high story building to his death. (laughs) 
that just felt so random like what are we doing now mm -hmm. um and then you said this felt like the neorealism version of house party yes it did <laughs> i thought an interesting scene was billy bud takes cast to a gay like, like a specifically gay bar where you have to be like a vetted member to get in mm -hmm. but it's clear that it's white it's not like not only is it try to protect the patrons it, they're trying to protect the gay white patrons yes and so they don't want any gay black people in there if i felt very much like the scene in pose where yeah AJ, that episode of pose mm -hmm. where she goes to sit in the the bar and they're like we don't want you here there's some interesting uh, the music in the movie too um Mm -hmm. Well, that's the only thing 70s feeling about it. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. But then I thought, oh, in the 90s, you know, these artists like George Clinton, Parliament Funkadelic, Sylvester, that that music when I was going to the gay bars in the 90s well, was popular as well. Sylvester's timeless. I hear that all the time in LA still. Like, so I so that's why I felt like this movie did not do a good job of taking me to the 70s because the sound, the look all felt very 90s to me. Yes. The this this white this violent white killer uh it it also made me think of the new movie Femme that I think comes out in April which I can't wait for you to see and we can talk about but um I don't know. I think there were just so many other ways to kind of uh, talk about a lot of things with that storyline in particular. And I, I was disappointed with how the can is eventually dispatched. Well, let's talk about that. So Chris and Kaz, uh, well, even before this, uh, Chris gets on the radio and gets really emotional Yes, at a point, And that came, felt like it came up from nowhere. Well, because then it made me feel like, is anybody listening to this? <laughs> is anyone is this, even hearing that? Is this really like Mia Farrow in Rosemary's Baby? This is really happening. I, <laughs> I couldn't tell. Then at a point, uh, Ken, the killer, captures Chris yeah and it looks like he's about to kill him and then the next scene is chris is running around the neighborhood trying to find Cass so they can go do a show and i'm thinking like first of all how'd you get away from the killer why are you not with the police especially since they brought you in accusing you of murder but they end up going to a show so they get a gig djing mm -hmm. and they are attacked like by the the racist guys the right? hitler youth mm -hmm. And one of them throws a Molotov cocktail at the stage, mm -hmm. which causes the stage to catch on fire. So like all of their music and the DJ set up. And, and this is at the point where Chris decides to put the tape on the loudspeaker of Ken. So he's playing the, the recording of the killing and then Ken the killer shows up on stage as the stage is on fire. So then, it, and then <laughs> the way the killer is dispatched is he basically like, falls through the stage and i'm assuming burns to death mm -hmm. and then that's the end of the movie yeah uh this was a mess but it was but it, it felt like a little uh gem that i'd never seen it was very charming mm -hmm. i would definitely recommend checking it out i think it would be fun to actually watch like a cute theater somewhere yeah if there was ever a screening you i kept, would go you kept uh trying to reference fat boy slim rockefeller skank i was yeah funk soul brother check it out now the I Fox said that. Soul. Yeah, you did. Wow. wow, I don't remember that. Okay. <laughs> well, I like that song. What would you give? I think Young Soul Three reference? is fair. I really like how it looks. Uh, you know, dis despite it not really feeling like late seventies to me, I, I really do like how it was shot. Um, and Isaac Julian, who is a multi hyphenate, and does, he's an artist that does a lot of things, but it's like, oh, I, I wish he made more films than he has if you look at his imdb page there's a picture of tilda swinton clutching his arm so he's a homosexual i'm clearly. assuming but uh maybe not i don't know um the cinematography by the way was by nina kelgren uh but yeah i think three out of five is I, I think fair i would give this film three out of five is there anything else you'd like to talk about uh, no all right ta-ta <laughs>